Okay, uh, so we will dive right into our speaker today. Um, and my dog is very excited, as you can probably hear, that we have Gov Hutchinson here today. Um, we've had Gov speak to us many times, and he probably doesn't really need an introduction, but I'm going to go ahead and give him one. Uh, he is the Assistant General Counsel of the California Association of Realtors, and he has been with CAR since 1985. I was seven in 1985, so he's been around a long time. Um, I'm sure, you know, Gov started at CAR right out of kindergarten too. So um, he uh, has been with CAR since 85. He manages uh, and managed CAR's legal member service program in Los Angeles. He advises realtors through the hotline on all aspects of real estate law and trains and supervises other hotline attorneys. I'm sure many of us have called into the hotline, myself included, such a great member benefit from CAR. Um, Gov received his bachelor's degree in history from Princeton and his JD from the University of Pennsylvania. He has written for the California Real Estate Magazine and co-authored CAR continuing education courses and is a master instructor for the education division of CAR with certification from the California Department of Real Estate. He also regularly speaks to associations and boards of realtors just like ours, affiliated trade associations, city and county bar associations and major real estate firms. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Gov to give us this update. And um, if you have questions, I'll just remind you now to put them in the Q&A, not in the chat, but the Q&A. And then um, Gov may take some of those questions along the way, but um, Sherry will monitor uh, the Q&A at the end of Gov's presentation, and we'll get to as many questions as we can in the time that we have. So uh, go ahead and take it away, Gov. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, apologize for my appearance. Hope it's not a distraction. Just had some minor basal cell skin cancer removed. It's not a big deal. But anyway, um, good morning. Good to see you virtually. I think I'll be seeing you in person sooner rather than later, because the very first thing I want to tell you is effective today, <clears throat> uh, the uh, mask wearing requirement in California is over, uh, except for like public transport and uh, healthcare facilities and things like that. But for just generally indoor public spaces, <clears throat> there's no more mask wearing requirement in California effective today which applies, I mean, it wasn't up until today, it was only wear a mask if you weren't vaccinated. But effective today, it's you don't have to wear a mask whether you're vaccinated or not, um, except in, in the, the places I mentioned, you know, healthcare, public transport, and, and school, I mean, and not schools either. So in other words, that's pretty big news. It does affect realtors in the sense of showings and open houses up until today, if you were not vaccinated, you were supposed to wear a mask at showings at open houses. Effective today, you don't have to wear a mask regardless of your vaccination status. The official rule is it's strongly recommended that you wear a mask, um, but it's not actually required. And of course, the owner of the property, the owner of the public setting can have whatever rules they want. I mean, someone could say, you wanna to come to my house you got to wear a mask. That's my rule, my house or your business. You could do that. Uh, but as far as California law, it's different. Now, I live in L.A. County. L.A. County has its own mask wearing ordinance, which is still in effect. So I don't think Sacramento has one. Um, you would know better than me if you have any local rules regarding mask wearing other than what I just said. So local rules would, stay, would take precedent, obviously. Individual property owners, individual business owners um, can, can do what they want. Now, having said that, you know your, your office, though, is regulated by Cal OSHA. And Cal OSHA still today has the rule that if you are unvaccinated in an office, you should be wearing a mask. Um, unless you're eating or drinking or alone in your office or um, have a religious or medical exemption, okay? So offices are not the same as, uh, <clears throat> I think they'll, they'll probably match up to what the 
uh, Department of Public Health did, but right now offices are a little different, okay? So obviously we're nearing the end, almost at the end of all uh, COVID related regulations uh, that would affect you. So, so that's, that's good news. Uh, the other thing that we're nearing the end of are rules, any restrictions on evictions. Remember for, I mean, for the last two years, that's all I've been talking about, COVID and evictions. The only restriction on evictions right now in California is, and this lasts till the end of March, another month, is if you're trying to evict someone for non-payment of rent, you're supposed to apply for housing, for rental assistance first. You're supposed to go to housingiskey.com, put, put your, whatever your city is there, and they'll tell you how to fill out an application. They'll send an email to your tenant, your tenant is supposed to fill out their own application. If they don't do it in 20 days, you can go ahead with the eviction. If they do go ahead with it, you gotta wait until the local authority decides whether you're gonna get rental assistance or not. But at the end of this month, 31 days from now, that will end. So even if you're in the process, let's say on March 31st, you're, you're waiting to get the rental assistance waiting to find out whether or not you're getting the rental assistance and that's holding up your eviction, starting March 31st, that no longer holds up your eviction. You can just go ahead and do an unlawful detainer. So you might have another month delay. These are evictions for non-payment of rent. All other evictions are just like pre-COVID. There's no restriction other than local areas. Once again, I'm in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is, very, is still strict. At Los Angeles, you cannot evict. I mean, you can't, you know, you can only evict from a single family house if the owner wants to move in. That's not true under state law. Under state law, you don't need a reason to evict, but just like it was pre COVID. But I'm not, I don't even follow this anymore, but I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, Bay Area, San Francisco, Berkeley, Oakland, they probably still have restrictions also. I don't really honestly know it. I don't follow that anymore, but. Other than local restrictions, the only restriction on evictions left, which it lasts for another month, and I'd be very surprised if it got extended beyond that, is the requirement if you're trying to evict for uh, <clears throat> purposes of, because the, pay, the, the tenant is not paying rent, then you have to apply for rental assistance first, okay? So that's, that's the latest on that stuff. Now, what I want to do for the rest of my time is just talk about new laws and forms that are taking effect in 2022. Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, one more thing. Uh, people ask me in general: Are there restrictions on how much I can increase someone's rent today? When someone asked me that question, I said you got to ask yourself three questions. Number one: Am I in a rent control city? Am I in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, Santa Monica? If so. You got to check with the local authorities, see how much you can increase the rent. Let's say my property is not subject to local rent control. Well, then I'm going to ask you, second question, is your, is your property more than, is it more than two units and is it more than 15 years old? If the answer to that is yes, you're under California rent control and you can only increase your rent by 5% plus inflation. The inflation rate today in Sacramento is four, meaning five plus four is nine percent. On August first, it looks like it's going to go up to ten percent, but there's a there's a, a cap. It never will go above ten percent. So if I want to increase my rent today in Sacramento, if I was <clears throat> because I'm under Calif if, if I'm under California rent control, then nine percent is the answer. August first, it'll be ten percent. But if it's a single family home, right, I'm not under California or local rent control, right? Right. Um, or or owner occupied duplex. So is there any restriction on me increasing my rent? And the answer is we still have throughout California some states of emergency, typically fire related. They're all over the state. They're still in effect. If I'm in a if my single family home is in a, or my 
newer than 15 year old apartment building. I'm not subject to local rent control. I'm not subject to California rent control. If my property is still in an area that is subject to a California state of emergency, I'm limited to 10%. How do I know if my property is in a state of emergency? There's a state agency, the Office of Emergency Services, OES. You go to their website, you can figure out if you're in a state of emergency. If you're not in any of those things, there's no restriction on how much you can increase the rent. Okay. All right. New laws that affect realtors. The governor signed 836 new laws. I'm going to tell you about every single, no, I'm not going to tell you about every single, there's about 30 of them that affect real estate. We have a handout on our website, 2022 new laws goes over all 30. I'm going to hit about 10, okay, Maybe the top 10 new laws that affect realtors. <clears throat> First, let's talk about the laws that directly affect realtors. One of them is, you may have heard that effective January 1st, if you're, if you're a landlord and you have a new tenant, a new residential tenant, you have to give them this mold booklet. It's not called the mold booklet. It's called information on dampness and mold for California renters. Only new tenants. If you had existing tenants carry over from last year, you'd have to do it. But if you have a brand new tenant, residential, starting in 2022, you must give them this booklet. You can get it for, you only have to send it to them electronically. You can get it for free on zip. There's a library on zip form called electronic publications, EPUBs. Once again, it's not called mold. Look, it's called information on dampness and mold for California renters. Give it to your tenant. If you're using the CAR residential lease form, form LR, it is already attached. It's pre-attached to the lease form that that CAR that zip form has for you. So you're done. So you're automatically, you're good with that new mold booklet. You know what's interesting? Why did the California Department of Public Health come out with a mold booklet this year? Why not last year, two years ago, next year? Some of you, like me, remember real estate in 2001. If you remember 2001, I'll never forget that year, everyone was panicking about mold. Do you remember that? Every speaker was a mold speaker. Everyone was worried about getting a mold inspection. Mold, mold, mold was just the thing of the, of the, the year. And there was a law passed in 2001 that directed the California Public of Health to do two things. Number one, come up with a mold booklet for tenants. And number two, come up with some scientific rec recommendations as to how much mold is an unsafe level. In other words, you can measure mold spores in the air. And the question is how much is a sort of a, a not healthy level? Some of us are gonna say, I don't want any mold. You know, I think any mold is unhealthy. But the point is the California Public, Department of Public Health was given two directives 21 years ago. Well, here we are 21 years later, they did one of them. They came up with a booklet. It only took 21 years, but we now have a booklet, but they still haven't done the other part. We still haven't done the other part, which is determining how much, what level of mold spores in the air is an unsafe level. But be honest with me, do any of you really care about mold anymore? Do you hire mold inspectors when you sell a house? I mean, specifically, that's all they do is they check for mold. It doesn't seem to be an issue, but we got a booklet. Just in case you were wondering about the booklet, it's 21 years late, okay? All right. Second law every realtor needs to know about is um, effective July 1st, we're gonna have a new disclosure form, but this is gonna be so easy for you. <clears throat> I mean, right now we have six disclosures, right? We got, <clears throat> we got the, uh, the TDS, I mean, we have five, I'm sorry, we have five. We have the TDS, of course, we have the NHD, of course, we have seller property questionnaire, of course, we have lead paint, that was four, and then the fifth one that, that happened last year, fire hardening defensible space, which is only required very high, high fire zones, which I'll talk about. The sixth one, which is coming July 1st, is the appraisal discrimination notice. This is simply gonna be a disclosure to your buyer telling them if you, if you got an appraisal and you think it was artificially low based on who you are, not based on the property itself, here's where to file a complaint. 
And when I say we're going to make it easy for you, we're going to pre-attach it to the purchase contract. So unlike the other five disclosures, TDS, NHD, SBQ, lead, and fire hardening defensible space, you have to come up with that yourself. This one, you're not going to have to come up with it. It's going to be pre-attached to the RPA. And remember, I don't know if you know this, if you give a disclosure to the buyer and they receive it before they sign the offer, they don't have the five-day right of rescission. So this particular form, unlike the other five forms I just mentioned, will not trigger a five-day right of rescission for the buyer because they're it's part of the purchase contract. So now some of you are gonna say, hey, that's a great idea. Why don't you attach the TDS and the SPQ and the lead paint, all the other forms to the, to the purchase contract also. So there's no five-day right of rescission. You know, a lot of realtors have figured that out. There are realtors, I would say primarily in the Bay Area, they do provide the disclosures to the buyer, sort of on a website or whatever. And they say, look at these before you submit your offer. If you give disclosures to the buyer before they sign the offer, they do not have a five-day right to cancel based on the disclosure. So all I'm saying is this latest one, this newest one, it's, it's automatic because it's pre-attached to the purchase contract, okay? So you're not even really gonna have to think about this law at all. It's just automatic, okay? Not gonna change your life significantly at all. Okay, other things that are happening that are affecting realtors. Um, good news, I think, this is good news, is there's a new law regarding, specifically about real estate agents, regarding use of your name in advertising. You know, you've all got a name, first name and a last name, right? You may have a middle name, whatever. The point is, you have a real estate license, and your name is on your real estate license. So California law says, if you're going to market yourself, by putting up for, for sale signs, any marketing of any kind, you have to use the name that's on your real estate license. By the way, you know, you don't, only your last name. You can have a first name that's a nickname, that's fine. But you have to use the last name that's on your license. Um, and your DRE number, of course. Here's the new law. The new law says maybe you have a particular last name on your license and then you get married or you get divorced or for whatever reason you want to change your last name on your official license. Under the old law, that means you had to throw away your old sign. You could only use the last name on your current license. New law says you can use the last name on your old license too. Maybe you've had three or four different last names in your real estate career. Maybe you've been married or divorced three or four times. Who knows? You can use all of those names. If you ever had a real estate license in that last name, you can use that last name in your marketing. You can have two different sets of signs, one with your pre-divorce name and one with your after-divorce name. You have that flexibility. So that's, I think flexibility is always good news. So that's a good thing. Okay, all right. Another new law that affects realtors. <clears throat> and this one, um, I don't know how often it's going to affect you, but okay. Um, you know what a deed restriction is or a restrictive covenant? Sometimes you'll come across, <clears throat> you, all, you all have a deed against your, a deed, uh, you receive a deed when you buy a property and your deed, normal grant deed, whatever. Sometimes there's a restriction on it. Sometimes it says something like, <clears throat> this property can never be used to sell alcoholic beverages or something like that. Or sometimes you have an affordable housing. This property can only be sold to people whose income is under whatever. Generally, those are legal, actually. <clears throat> but occasionally, you'll come across a deed restriction that's clearly not legal. It says, this property can only be sold to Caucasians or something like that. And sometimes this will not be on your deed. Sometimes it's part of the CCNRs. Now, ever since 1948, that type of restriction is illegal, right? It's totally unenforceable. So who cares? Well, some people care. Some people say, and I'm offended that if you look up my property in the public record, there's this, you know, racist whatever deed restriction. Or I'm offended that the CCNRs recorded against my property have something like that. So they want it removed from the records. 
Well, there's a new law that says this is easily done. If there's an unlawful deed restriction or cut restrictive covenant against your property, you can go to the county recorder's office and there's a form you fill out. You don't have to pay a cent and within three months they have to remove it. Okay, how does any of this, and by the way, every county recorder's office in California has to set up their own program where they're gonna event, they're gonna go through all of the deeds in their entire stock and eventually go through get rid of them. But if you actually go to the office and ask for it, they'll have to do it in three months. How does any of this affect realtors? Listen to this. The law says if you have a listing or a sale and you happen to know as a realtor that there is one of these unlawful deed restrictions against the property, you have a disclosure obligation to your client to tell them, hey, did you know you can now go to the county recorder's office and get it done for free in three months, blah, blah, blah. Of course, this, this assumes that you actually know. In my experience, the average realtor just doesn't know this. You're not required to look at the deed and you're not required to look at the CCNRs. Chances are you probably haven't. So chances are you don't even know if there's a deed restriction or CCNR like this. And you don't have to know. You're not required to know. But if you happen to know, there's a disclosure obligation, July 1st. So we've created a form for you. If, you. if you ever, you may go through your whole life, you're never in this situation. But if you're ever in this situation, we have something, it's not on zip form, it's on the CAR website, something called, we have, we have something called sample legal letters. Usually they're like demand letters. Like instead of hiring a lawyer, you can look up one of our letters. It's dear seller, you have to do this. Dear agent, you have to do this. Anyway, we have a new sample legal letter that's, it's the notice to client regarding unlawful deed restriction, if you ever happen to be in that situation. You may go through your whole life, you never know this, but just in case, there you go, okay? All right. Another thing that sort of indirectly affects realtors, did you know when you, when you, when you do a home, hire a home inspector, right? You hire a home inspector, do a home inspection, and they do an inspection and they discover problems. Did you know you can't hire that person to do the repairs of the home uh, recommended by the home inspection they just did for at least 12 months? The person who did the home inspection can't do the, that same person can't do the work, okay, um, for 12 months. There's now an exception to that. If your home inspector, as part of their inspection, inspects the sewer lateral connection, the connection from the main sewer line to the to the house. First of all, you have to have a particular type of contractor's license to do that type of inspection. But let's say the home inspector you hired does have that contractor's license, is able to do the sewer lateral inspection as part of their general inspection. And then they come back with the inspection and say, we, we recommend this work being done on the sewer lateral you can pay that person to do that work, just that work, not any other work, okay? So see what I mean, a slight, slight change there. Is this a big deal? No, this is not a big deal. You'll notice most of the new laws this year are not really a big, big deal, which is probably, with one exception, which I'm about to get to. But in general, we don't have any traumatic, really new laws this year that affect realtors, with one exception, SB9, which I'll get to in a second. Another thing affecting realtors is um, starting not this year, but starting in 2023, when it's time to renew your license and you got to take, you know, the certain number of hours of continuing education in order to renew your real estate license. Um, <clears throat> you're going to starting 2023, there's going to be an extra hour of classes and the extra hour is gonna be on something called implicit bias, teaching us basically all of us without even unconsciously knowing it have some have various biases and, and it's gonna, how to identify those, how to address those and also just gonna be a little bit more fair housing stuff, okay? So um, that's coming and um, Sean Palmer, I can see what you're asking about termite inspections. No, what I was talking about the termite inspector can definitely do the termite work. Okay, I think that's what you're asking. But anyway, um, I know there are more questions. I'll look at those in a sec. Other new laws 
that, um, <clears throat> you know, in fact, I'll do the questions right now. Michelle Lehman, would a buyer need to sign the disclosures? Very, very, very good question. Remember I said, if you give the disclosures to the buyer before they sign the offer, they don't have a five-day right of rescission. Do I have to prove that they actually sign the disclosures? And the answer is no. On the other hand, how are you going to prove they got them if they didn't sign them? I mean, you could send them like a receipt saying, sign this acknowledging you received all the disclosures. So they don't have to sign the individual TDS, NHD, et cetera, if they sign something acknowledging that they received them. Okay, you see what I'm saying? But you still need to, if you want, no five-day right of rescission. And which leads to the very good question from anonymous attendee about this whole five-day right of rescission. It's the most complicated thing in real estate. You have contingencies and you have a right of rescission, right? The purchase contract typically gives the buyer 17 days to remove contingencies. One of the eight contingencies is called seller documents. Seller documents includes the disclosures. So you're absolutely right. If you're thinking this way, every buyer pretty much has 17 days to look at the disclosures. But let's say you make a non-contingent offer, which is people are doing nowadays, or maybe they're removing their contingencies in 10 days or five days. My point is, even if you've removed your contingencies, you still separately have a five-day right to cancel triggered by those disclosures. So I guess what I'm really saying is that a seller can eliminate your right to cancel and seller can say, I want a non-contingent offer and I'm giving you all these disclosures before you even sign your offer. In that case, the buyer has no way out of the deal. They're committed, right? Because they've removed their contingencies and they've waived their five-day right to cancel triggered by the disclosures because they were given the disclosures prior to the time they signed the offer, okay? Very good questions because it comes up every day all the time, okay? All right, I'll get to the next questions in a second. Just really two more things I wanna talk about. You know, I got back to that, getting back to that, uh, the newest disclosure last year, the fire hardening and defensible space, right? Um, <clears throat> first of all, I'm gonna clear up what I've run into some confusion. And second, I wanna tell you about a new thing. Okay, so remember I said you got these big disclosures you got to do. There are five of them, and there's a sixth one coming. One of them is the fire hardening defensible space. What triggers this? Well, first of all, it's only required in a TDS transaction. So probate, REO, bankruptcy sale, trust sale, no TDS, no fire hardening defensible space. But if it is a TDS transaction, residential one to four, then this form is required, but only if you're in a very high or high fire hazard zone, right? Every one of us, when we own a house, there's four possibilities. I'm not in a fire zone. I'm in a moderate fire zone. I'm in a high fire zone, or I'm in a very high. The only time I have to do the fire hardening disclosure is if I'm in the last two, high or very high. If I'm in a moderate fire zone, if I'm, in, if I'm not in a fire zone at all, I don't have to do this one. Which means every time you take a listing, you gotta figure out if your listing is in a very high or high fire zone. Well, how do I do that? You look at your NHD report, which is required every deal you ever do. There are two fire boxes. One says very high fire zone, one says wildland fire area. Let's say neither box is checked. You're not in a fire zone, you don't need the form. Let's say the very high fire zone box is checked. You're in a very high fire zone, you need the form. What if the wildland fire area box is checked? What's that telling you? That's telling you you're either in a moderate or a high. It's not telling you which one. It's telling you you're in a state fire responsibility. You're in a Cal Fire area and you're in a moderate or a, or a high. But Gubb, you just got through telling me the the fire hardening defensible space form is only required if I'm in a high. So how do I know if I'm in a high or a moderate? You have to dig deeper. You have to go to your NHD rep and say, please tell me 
if I'm in a high or a moderate. In other words, even though they're not required to distinguish between those two on the NHD form, they do know they can figure out for you whether you're in a high or a moderate. Or if you want to, you can look at the CAL FIRE maps yourself. But I would, I would, I would, I would ask my NHD person to do it, okay? Um, so your NHD person says you're in a high, the form is required, you're in a moderate, the form is required. Now, did you notice what I said? I said, if the NHD box says you're in a wildland fire, you're in a Cal fire, state fire responsibility area. What if you're not in a Cal fire area? That means your fire company is your local fire company. Usually you're not in a state fire responsibility, you're in a local fire responsibility area, which means if there's a fire, Cal fire doesn't come, my local fire company comes. Did you know right now, local fire responsibility areas are mapped either very high or nothing. There's no such thing as a high or moderate fire zone in a local fire responsibility area. That's gonna change this year. Cal Fire is now under a mandate to map local fire responsibility areas into not just very high or nothing, very high, high, moderate or nothing. So number one, we're gonna have new maps this year. So there are gonna be more listings that are gonna be in high fire areas. But if you're really thinking this through, you realize, hey, the NHD report, there's a box for wildland fire areas, which means state fire responsibility areas. And there's a box for very high fire zone. There's no box on the NHD report telling me that I'm in a high fire zone in a local fire responsibility area. So what's gonna happen is the NHD form is gonna change this year too. I'm telling you this because when it happens, it'll be before the next time you see me, right? So just don't be shocked. And we'll put out something to all the members when this happens. But at some point this year, there's gonna be a, probably a third box on the NHD to disclose if you're in a high fire zone in a local area, okay? By the way, one big thing on the, we still get confusion on this. So you've determined you're in a high or very high, you pull out the form. Then you determine if the house is built before or after 2010. If it's built before 2010, your seller has to answer the questions in paragraph three. If the home is built after 2010, they don't have to answer those questions. But then there's paragraph four, the defensible space paragraph. You have four choices. You only have to check in paragraph four B, third or fourth choice, if your listing is in a community where there is a local law requiring that the property owner has to do a defensible space inspection before they sell the house. Do you know we've only found one community in California where that's clearly the case and that's Truckee? If your listing is not in Truckee, you got to check with your you can check with your local government, but we've found, we haven't really found any other cities that have a mandate Oh, you can't sell your house without doing a defensible space inspection. I've, we've come across a couple small towns, I think in uh, Marin County and Placer County. I don't know of a single one in Sacramento County, for example. If you, you would know better than me if, there, if your local city has a local law that says you can't sell a house in this city until you do a defensible space inspection. I doubt you're gonna find that, which really means when you're filling out that form, you're never gonna check box three or four. You're just gonna ask your seller a question. Hey, seller, have you for some reason had a defensible space inspection in the last six months? They say, yes, you check box number two and give the documentation to the buyer. I would say 90% of the, 98% of your listings, the seller's gonna say, nope. Uh, Laurel, thanks, El Dorado has, has, has plenty of them if you're in El Dorado. Um, Chances are, if you're in Sacramento County, most of your listings, you're not gonna check any of the boxes in paragraph 4B of the fire hardening defensible space form. It's gonna to default to paragraph to, to number one, which says the buyer has a responsibility within a year after close to obtain documentation that they're in compliance with the 100 foot of defensible space, which means it's something the buyer worries about after close, it's not your problem, okay? All right.
The last big law I want you to know about is the most important new law in real estate this year. And that of course is SB9. Um, it sounds revolutionary in a sense it is, but in a sense it's not. Uh, here's the deal. You have a single family house. You're in R1 zoning. That means single family house. So you wanna build another house. Well, wait a second, you're in single family. You can't build another house. Up until SB9, if you wanted to build another house, you had to go to the city, ask for a variance. They give you a hearing maybe, you have to do an environmental impact report and they can still say no. They have the absolute discretion to say no. SB9 says, as long as you meet certain requirements, even though you're in single family zoning, you can build a second house attached or detached. Now, what gives me the right, and when I say you can do it, I mean, I mean, the city has to allow it under what's called ministerial approval. They don't, there's no environmental impact report. There's no hearing. If you meet the requirements, they have to say yes. Well, what are the requirements? First of all, it's gotta be an urban area. How do I know if I'm in an urban area? You check with the US Census Bureau, website. Second requirement, it can't be farmland, it can't be conservation area, can't be historic district, can't be landmark district, can't be earthquake fault zone, unless you've upgraded the property, can't be a 100-year flood zone, unless you've upgraded the property, can't be very high fire zone, unless you've upgraded. So there are a lot of restrictions. Not only that, the city can pass design standards, and they can say, even if you meet all these other criteria, if you wanna add a second property, it's gotta have certain type of look, it's gotta have certain setbacks, and it can be no bigger than 800 square feet. The city can actually restrict these new SB9 properties to 800 square feet. So in my impression, there aren't gonna be a whole lot of people who are dying to take advantage of this SB9, even if they're allowed to. But the point is, if you want to, and you meet all these criteria and you meet the local, I mean, some cities are not strict at all. Some cities want this. Some cities are encouraging these new properties to be built. And they're saying, there's no restriction, do what you want. Many cities are putting restrictions because they don't want it. Some cities are expanding their uh, historic districts. Some cities are saying they can't be, the new house can't be bigger than 800 square feet. See what I'm saying? By the way, and if you're in an HOA, the HOA can just prohibit it. Even if the city wants it, the HOA can say no. So there are a lot of restrictions here, but it's possible. And there's also something called a lot split. If I have a lot, single family lot, I can actually split it and put two properties on each one. If I meet the criteria I just mentioned, and the person doing the lot split has to sign an affidavit promising that they're gonna live in one of the units after the lot split for at least three years as their primary residence. But once again, the same restrictions apply as to building the new property, okay? Um, so we have a Q&A on this. If you're interested, check it out. Um, it talks about the restrictions and they're not. By the way, I always like to point something else out to you. Did you know that, forget SB9, a couple of years ago, a law was passed in California that makes it a lot easier to build an accessory dwelling unit. Let's say before SB9, today I got a single family house. I wanna convert my garage to a second unit. I can do it. If I meet the building code, city can't stop me. HOA can't even stop me. If I wanna convert my garage, and I make the building code, I can do it. You know what else I can do? I can add another detached accessory dwelling unit. HOA can't stop me, city can't stop me. As long as I, it meets, it's no more than 16 feet high, four foot setback, once again, 800 square foot limitation. So if I wanna build another 800 square foot unit on my property, I can either do ADU, or I can do SB9. ADU might even be better, you know why? HOA can't stop me. You know what else is good about the ADU? I can do a short-term rental. If I build a new unit under SB9, 
I cannot short-term rental it, even if I get it approved. Okay, there's a few more details to this, but that's the high, that's that's the key part. Let me go to the questions. Um, Linda Wood, good question. Usually you see the deed when you receive the prelim. If you do, if you if you see the deed, it's the law is interesting. It says, it says, even if you see the deed, you don't necessarily have to read it. So I don't know what that means. Linda, if you're telling me that you typically do see the deed and do actually look at it, then yeah, you would give this disclosure. If you see the illegal one, you know, the racist one or something, you do make the disclosure. It's not a disclosure like the TDS. It's just a, a letter you're giving your clients. It doesn't trigger any right of rescission or anything. There's no penalty if you don't do it. You're just gonna get a sample legal letter and do it, okay? I mean, I don't know how else to tell you that, <clears throat> uh, but that, that's a good question. Jennifer, is there a three-day right to rescind upon signing the contract? No, contrary to popular belief, buyers never have an automatic three-day right to rescind. The disclosures that I mentioned give them a five-day right to rescind, but only if you give them after they've signed the offer. If you give disclosures to the buyer, before they sign the offer, no. Um, James, if the listing agent adds it to their disclosures, there's a good question. Getting back to the, these are all good questions, by the way. Getting back to the fire hardening defensible space, let's say, and I've noticed this, some brokers are providing this form to the buyer, even though you're not in a very high or high. I haven't figured out why. They just think it's good, good information. If you do that, no, you don't need the buyer to sign it um, because you're giving them something for informational purposes rather than required. And um, no, buyer, if you're a buyer and you give me that, and I'm, if you're giving me that form and I'm in a moderate or no zone, I don't have to sign, I can just ignore it. If I may sign, I may not. It doesn't trigger any obligation to do anything. Estella, fire insurance. Yeah, I mean, the fire, the insurance companies obviously make their own determination as to how much insurance they're going to charge. And of course, they look at these maps too. That's all I can tell you. Um, and I'm just intending getting back to what I just said. You're right. There's a box on the form that says that the home is not in a fire zone. Right. Agents are still demanding it and they check the box and insist it's required. It's just an education issue. If you're not in a high or very high, the form is not required. The listing agent can't, isn't required to give it to you. And if they do give it to you, you're not required to sign it. Okay. <clears throat> um, Eli, yes, confirming property is, I guess I hit a hot button here. Property is in, not in a very high or fire zone. The form is not required. Ron Crane, that 800, 800 square foot maximum, that depends on the city. I'm saying cities can, if they want to, restrict the new SB9 properties to 800 square feet. They don't have to, and not all cities are. Linda, same thing. CCNRs are the deed. It's the exact same thing. Um, I think I answered anonymous attendee already about the ADU versus the uh, SB9, but you know, I'm going to give everyone my email address. Email me if you have anything I don't cover, okay? Because I'm almost done. GovH at car.org, if I didn't get it. Um, Eli again, yes, you're welcome, blah, blah, blah. Anything new with HOA? No, not really. I think I got all the questions. All right, thank you so much, Gov. Um, I, I noticed that there were a lot of um, questions put into the chat earlier. I think Gov addressed pretty much all of those. Um, just remember, as we do these meetings, we want the questions in the Q&A feature, not the chat. Um, so thank you so much. Always um, so great to have you. Very thorough update. And I mean, we have well over 200 attendees on this Zoom, which is so great to see um, that, you know, so many of you guys are, are here getting this really relevant, great up-to-date information. So thank you again, Gov. Thank you. And I got to leave. So uh, have a good rest of your meeting.